Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sesame. I'm the program coordinator at Bus Boys and Poets Books. Tonight, we are joined by Clyde W. Ford. He is a psychotherapist here to talk to us about his fantastic new work of Blood and Sweat. It is a compelling look at the past that holds broad implications for present day calls for racial equality, racial justice, and the abolishment of systematic racism. So, Without further ado, welcome, Clyde. Thank you, Sesame. Thank you very much for inviting me by Bus Boys and Poets to talk about my latest book. Um, I get the opportunity, because this is my, what, 13th or 14th book, to speak in a lot of different venues. And I have to say that of all the venues that I have spoken at, the opportunity to come to Busboys and Poets to speak, even though it's virtually, is really special to me. And it's special because of the kind of really community space that uh, Busboys and Poets creates rep and represents. And it's also special because I know I'm following in the footsteps of some pretty remarkable individuals. <laughs> authors, poets, musicians, thinkers who have gone before me right here at Busboys and Poets. So <laughs> I really appreciate that opportunity. And for all of you who are joining us, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of things in this presentation. One, one I'm, I'm going to read a short selection from the book. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the book in relationship to current events that are taking place. I'm also gonna make sure that I leave some time for questions and answers. So please feel free to use the comments section of this presentation screen in order to, at any point during the presentation, to jot down any thoughts or ideas or questions uh, that you might like to have answered, but I won't be answering those questions until the end of the presentation. I just wanna say one other thing um, as we start. Yes, I am trained as a chiropractor and psychotherapist, but my love, my passion, and actually my degree was in history. So uh, I consider myself uh, to be a historian, and I consider this book of Blood and Sweat, Black Lives and the Making of White Power and Wealth, a fulfillment of really uh, something that I began many, many years ago as an undergraduate major in history at Wesleyan University. And the truth of the matter is, I actually went back to my the senior thesis as the basis for this book. I had written years ago, and we're talking, I'm not even saying when because it'll date me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wrote uh, a senior thesis way before there were black studies programs or black studies curriculum. And it was on Africans in Virginia from 1619 to 1700. Wow. So since you know, and your readers and customers hopefully will also know that this is part of the time period that I cover in the book, um, I just want to say before I begin that um, I've been thinking about this book for a long time. And then along came the pandemic. I had nothing to do at the beginning of the pandemic except write. And I had a publisher in HarperCollins who was interested in the book. And so, Sesame, I said to myself, you know what? For the next six to nine months, all I'm going to do is write. What else could I do? We were in lockdown. What else can you do? You can't go anywhere. <laughs> can't go any place. I'm just going to write. So you never know when um, something that seems like it's really not so fortuitous turns out to be very fortuitous in terms of one's creativity. So what I want to do... Yeah, I want to start the presentation. Um, All right, and I want to I'm going to head off and let you start. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Later. Thank you, <laughs> and I'll see you later. Bye. Once again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Look, I want to begin by reading from the first chapter of Of Blood and Sweat, Black Lives and the Making of White Power and Wealth. And uh, as I'm beginning to read, from the book, uh, I also want to remind you, and I checked in with Sesame before uh, we started the program, I did send along some autographed book plates 
to Busboys and Poets. So for any of you who are purchasing the book through Busboys and Poets, and I certainly hope you will, um, you also will have the opportunity to get an autographed book plate that you can affix to the inside front cover of the book. So from chapter one, the beginning of a blood and sweat. Antony Negro and Isabel Negro is how they were known in the 1625 ledger of Captain William Tucker of Elizabeth City, Virginia. In all likelihood, they also had African names that only the ages know now. They may have been baptized shortly after birth and their anglicized names conferred then by Portuguese priests who'd ventured deep into the interior of Angola, where Catholicism was well established by the 16th century. Or Portuguese priests may have performed obligatory baptisms and christenings of these two young people as they were herded into the hold of the San Juan the Baptist, a Portuguese slave ship at anchor in Luanda Bay off the coast of Angola in the late Central African rainy season of 1619. Let's call them Anthony and Isabella for our narrative. Two among the 20 and odd Negroes, Sir John Rolfe recorded aboard the Dutch man of war, White Lion, lying at anchor on August 20th, 1619, at the mouth of the James River off of Point Comfort. Anthony and Isabella carried within them the germinal seeds of the first black child born in America, though on that fateful day in August of 1619, they probably did not know that, nor did they know his name. Nor could they have known that symbolically they also carried within them the germinal cells of Scipio and Crispus and Nat and Sojourner and Maggie and Frederick and Booker T and W.E.B. and Marcus and Langston and Duke and Yardbird and Train and Malcolm and Martin and Rosa and Barack and Trayvon and Eric and Brianna and George and me and countless millions who in some measure or part were torn like them from Africa's soil. Anthony and Isabella stepped from the decks of the white lion into a pinnace, bobbing in the surf off Point Comfort, a small boat that would carry them to the white planters and merchants and colonists waiting ashore, men who had just determined their worth in terms of salted meat and vegetables and grain and the other provisions needed by the captain of the White Lion. What they did not know then, could not have known then, is that in being handed over to these men, they were about to embark on a journey of unimaginably epic proportions, a heroic journey in which during their lives, they would endure great hardships and privations, a symbolic journey that would see their work lay the foundations of economics, politics, religion, medicine, education, industry, law enforcement, and technology of a new nation. And a hard earned journey that would generate great power and wealth for some that sadly, Anthony and Isabella and those like them for the most part, would never share. In their interactions with those white men ashore lay the embryonic maps of many roads, some surveyed and taken, others surveyed and deemed unworthy. American slavery, American freedom, Bacon's rebellion, the Revolutionary War, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, Nat Turner's rebellion, the cotton gin, the age of sale, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, the Great Migration, railroads, mines, oil drilling, lynchings, Red Summer, two world wars, two marches on Washington, the murders of Malcolm and Martin, the gunning down of Trayvon and Ahmad, the killing of George Floyd, 
and the many other events shaped by the interaction of black folks and white folks in America. Anthony and, and Isabella did not know this then and neither did then ashore, like Captain William Tucker, who would acquire and settle the couple to work on his plantation near present day Hampton, Virginia. But today, we can know what became of those seeds, real and symbolic, which Anthony and Isabella carried within them. We can know of the roads taken and those that were not. And where they could not know, we must not forget. Thank you. That's from the opening chapter to of Blood and Sweat. Now, one of the frequent comments that or remarks, questions that I get about this book is, is a Blood and Sweat a book about critical race theory? And I thought that would be a really good place to talk a little bit more about the subject matter of, of Blood and Sweat, and maybe even um, instigate and use some questions that we can uh, toss around later. So my answer to that almost always is no, it is not about a book about critical race theory. And here's why I say that. I think that in the discussion, it's not even really a discussion because there, a discussion requires at least two sides that have some reasonable understanding of what they're even discussing. But in the public discourse on critical race theory, both sides, both those who would say I'm for it and those who are, are very vocal about being against it, have lost sight of what critical race theory is. A theory is a way of looking at an assemblage of facts. In terms of critical race theory, critical race theory is a way of looking at historical facts. But we should never confuse or conflate the way of trying to understand historical truths and fact, which is theory, from those historical truths and facts themselves. And that's where many folks go astray when they are either saying they're for or against critical race theory, is what they're confusing is a theory which attempts to explain and understand facts with the very facts that that theory is attempting to explain and understand. So let me give you a really practical example that comes from the book. Um, I write about in, in one of the chapters how uh, Thomas Jefferson, I mean, we know he held slaves, but uh, he, uh, he enslaved men and women of African descent. But to me, while that is heinous, it is really some of the things that he did with the men and women, women he enslaved that were even worse. So in the book, I talk about the historical fact that Jefferson used the men and women he enslaved as collateral for his mounting debt. Now, I'm not making up that fact. I went to the Jefferson estate. You can find it on the internet or find it on the uh, book's website. And I think that's flashing across your screen right now of bloodandsweat.com and actually see an image written in Jefferson's hand of him pledging to his creditors in England and Amsterdam by name the enslaved men and women that he wanted to pledge as collateral for the money he owed to these credit these European creditors. That's a historical fact. That's the truth. Uh, yes, I suppose in this day and age, uh, some might want to argue, oh, that that's not a historical fact. I can think of a couple of people, uh, some of them former presidents who might want to argue that never happened. Well, the truth of the matter is the Jefferson estate says it happened. The Library of Congress says it happened. 
And I think we've got the goods in Jefferson's hand to indicate that, yes, that truth actually happened. I think it's perfectly fine, acceptable, and really important that folks know that fact. How you interpret it, the theory you use to understand it, um, that's something we can have a reasonable discourse about. So I want to make that separation. Uh, but I also want to add that in talking and presenting historical truths in this book, one of the other things that I came to realize is that many of those historical tr truths and facts support the premises, notions, and ideas of critical race theory. So once again, I will say the book is not about critical race theory. It's about historical truths and fact. Does it support the ideas of critical race theory? Yes, it does. What I'd like to do now is very briefly go through some of the historical epochs, the time periods that I spoke about, I speak about in this book. And to give those of you who are listening on a sense of what I feel was so important about those ver various periods. So the first place that I begin the book, and I, you know, I think everybody goes back to 1619, August of 1619, as this kind of seminal moment. Uh, and many people will say that's the start of slavery in America. I don't believe that, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But it seemed to me, uh, particularly if I was wearing my historian's hat, that it might really be important to go back a little before that period of time. Because one of the things that historians like to do, and I certainly love to do, is if an event happens, there's got to be reasons why that event happened, and those reasons don't show or manifest themselves at the same time that the event does. So if in 1619, a ship, the White Lion, pulled into the mouth of the James River and had on board some 20 or so Africans who were bartered for food and water and other provisions, how did that ship get there? Why was that ship there? Who was responsible for that ship being there? And where did that all begin? And interestingly, that story really starts uh, several centuries before 1619 August. It starts in the late 1400s, 15th century, in Angola. And while I say so much more about this in the book, I want to just indicate some of the things that I think were really important about that period of time. One of the things that was really important about that period of time is that the Portuguese were the principal colonizers of the Angola Congo region. And one of the things that they did is that they really were very adept at using the kingdom of the Congo and the kingdom of Angola, also called the kingdom of Ndongo, to fight each other. And they, they actually hired African mercenaries to do this. It's a fascinating story. Again, I think I tell it a little better in the book than I probably could now. And you get a chance to read it and mull over it uh, if you so choose. But the idea is, is that very early on, it was the Portuguese who were the first explorers from Europe to enter into uh, the Angola Congo region of Africa and there to extract both the mineral and human resources that they found. Now, another thing comes up that I also talk about in the book, and that is the fact that these early European explorers were not some altruistic uh, white men who were out to explore the world and to welcome into the fold all the various cultures that they found. I am sorry, the story that we got, that I got as a young man in school about Christopher Columbus and all these other ex explorers, that was a lot of BS. Those explorers, and I cite this in the book and I give the example in the book and I reproduce the document, were operating 
under some of the most brutal sanctions, and by this I mean sanctions encouraging them to pillage, plunder, and put into slavery any and every civilization and culture they came in contact with. And who issued that proclamation? It was the Catholic Church. And in particular, what's called a papal bull. And no, that's not an animal with horns. It's a, a, a writing that comes from the Pope that then is taken as really serious law directly from God by the faithful. And this particular papal bull issued by uh, Pope Nicholas V um, in the late 1400s, early 1500s, has a funny name. I, I really think it's funny if you think of it in English. The Latin name is Dum Diversus. And uh, anything but being dumb, Dum Diversus translates into Latin, and meaning basically, until I change this, until you get other word, you, meaning you explorers, are given free reign to subjugate, kill, enslave any other civilizations you come up and meet in the process of your journey. Interestingly enough, Columbus actually came to uh, the Western Hemisphere, not with the idea, again, of welcoming, welcoming in all of these civilizations uh, that he might come in contact with, but actually came to uh, the Western Hemisphere with the idea that he would find gold or other precious minerals, and in order to mine that gold or those precious minerals, he would enslave the people, the indigenous people of the Americas, Central America, even as far as Florida, that he found. Now, I'm telling you this story because of this reason. There was a problem with Columbus's plan, something he didn't anticipate. And the something he didn't anticipate is that not only did he bring the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, but the crew on board he brought also brought with them pandemics from Europe, plague, and yellow fever. And, oh, I think I read at some point there were 39 different uh, diseases that um, Europeans brought to the New World and decimated, decimated the native populations here. So out the window goes Columbus's plan to enslave in large numbers the native population that he would find in the Americas. And now the Portuguese are thinking, oh my God, what do we do? Where do we look for labor now? And guess where they looked? They looked to Africa. And I found it really interesting that while I was writing this book during a pandemic, a pandemic itself, particularly the disease uh, brought from Europe to the Americas, was really one of the instigating factors uh, that caused Europe early on the Portuguese to turn to Africa as a source of people who they would enslave uh, to work in their mines and uh, to work on their plantations and other things. Now, this is still long before America even is colonized because remember, America is not colonized or this continent, North America is not colonized um, by the English for sure until the early part of the 1600s, 1607, 1620 in Massachusetts, 1607 uh, in Virginia are the typical dates that are given for that. So let's hop, skip, and jump now uh, to 1619. I don't hop, skip, and jump in the book. I tell the story a little bit more. We're at 1619, and a lot of people think here are 20 and some odd Africans who get off the ship, and they are the first enslaved people um, in the Americas. There was, some of you remember, particularly because of where I'm speaking of uh, in 16, seven, uh, excuse me, 19, uh, 2017, 2018, let me get my dates right, when then governor of Virginia Northam was embroiled in all of that dispute around him being caught in pictures in blackface. 
And in trying to redeem himself, he was on the Gail King show. And you might remember that clip from the Gail King show where um, it was 2019, because Northam was saying 400 years ago, off of Point Comfort, the first African indentured, and Gail cut him off right there and said, no, you mean the first slaves. And I heard that and I thought, you know, it's really funny. Both of them are right and both of them are wrong. And here's what I mean and here's why I feel it's so important to understand what happened in 1619 that many people just gloss over by saying that's when slavery started. Anthony and Isabella, who I write about in the first part of the book, did not step off of that ship into a system of slavery. Nobody before them had sat down and said, boy, you know, let's come up with ideas about slavery. So if we ever get some African folks here, we'll already have all of this set up and we can just go right ahead and enslave these people. That's not how it happened. In fact, and this again, I just find so surprising that it is not taught in school. The historical truth of the matter is what those white men ashore in 1619 did have in place was a very brutal system of indentured servitude. And I know it's popular for some writers to write about white indentured servitude as though it was some kind of guesswork or program that allowed uh, European men and women to come to the United States to work. No, 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 it was not that. White indentured servitude subjected those who were indentured servants to these really, really, really harsh, terrible conditions. In fact, my friend and teacher and mentor, the late Lerone Bennett, who I cite in the book and who I actually dedicate the book to, was to say, I think in a beautiful way, that white indentured servitude was the proving ground for what would later become chattel slavery. That's deep. And I think it's important. And the other thing that goes along with it that is important is, so here we have Anthony and Isabella stepping on shore in Virginia. They step into this system in which no one really has articulated a means of chattel slavery yet. And the question then becomes, what do we do? And here is where I think we come to an important insight about this country. Leron Bennett would often talk about this as the roads taken and the roads not taken. The question was, what do you do with those folks, those Africans who have been brought here? They're obviously not free men and women, but again, they didn't have a system of slavery in place at that point in time. And so the years from 1619, somewhere about 1660, 1670, I think are pivotal in understanding how we went in this country from a country of maybe brutal indentured servitude where blacks and whites were subject to some harsh conditions to a country in which if you were of African descent, you were now considered to be the property and you were then enslaved. That transition, which I talk about at length in the book, is critical to understanding the roads that were taken and the roads that were not taken in this country because we are still dealing with those issues today. And let me just give you one example of what I'm talking about when I say that. So in 1656, very close now to the point in time what I would point to and say, yes, by this point in time, chattel slavery exists in the United States, 1656. There is a, a black woman named Elizabeth Key who actually genealogists have traced Johnny Depp back to, and I think a couple of other famous folks that we know today. Anyway, Elizabeth Key, 1656, is the daughter of an African woman who probably 
was one of the first, well, not probably, I mean, she was born in 1630. So um, um, this woman was the first generation of Africans to arrive in this country. And uh, they arrived, uh, arrived in this country at a time when this, a lot of things were kind of up, up in flux. Anyway, Elizabeth Key is treated as though she's property and handed off from one owner to another. And she says, 1656, now, oh no, I am not to be entreated as an enslaved person. And she took her case to court. Now, again, I talk at length about Elizabeth's case in court, uh, and I don't have the time or really think we should do that. Now, I just want to give you the key elements of this because you it'll show you what I'm talking about. So there were several bases upon which Elizabeth Key said um, she should not be held as an enslaved person. But the two main ones were this. Her father was European and free, and she was baptized as a Christian. Now, at the time, the law in the American colonies followed English law, and English law said the status of the child father follows the status of the father. At the time, religion and spirituality in the colonies followed religion and spirituality in England, and that said, Christianity said, you can't hold another Christian uh, enslaved. And so the court then ruled 1656 57 in Elizabeth Key's favor because the justices were following the legal and spiritual traditions that they were inherited. Well, I have to tell you, and again, I talk about this in the book, that the colonies went up in arms. Maryland passed a law which said, doesn't matter if you're baptized or not, you can still be held um, as a slave. Virginia followed not long after. Maryland went ahead with a law that said, look, forget about that stuff about following the, 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 uh, the status of the father. Whether you're enslaved or not, you follow the status of the mother. Virginia also came right along with a similar kind of law. Those are examples of how religion, spirituality, and really importantly, the legal system was warped in this country. A new system was created in order to support the enslavement of people of African descent. And that goes on and on and on through every epoch of history, certainly of every epoch that I, would, that I spoke about in this book, from pre-colonial days right through the end of the Civil War. And certainly we can see some of that happening even today. So that's the early part of the book. Uh, I want to skip towards the end of the book in these closing few moments of my remarks, because I think there's something else that's really, really important to talk about. Ten days ago, California Task Force on Reparations for Slavery made a very important initial determination that, yes, reparations should happen. Of course, they didn't say exactly how, but they basically said, yes, they should happen and that those reparations should go to people who can trace their genealogy to slavery. Now, I felt that was important because, you know, here is a commission impaneled by Governor uh, Gavin Newsom making a determination about reparations. Uh, and I thought that's really great. I'm really glad to see this conversation proceeding. I think when it comes to this idea of reparations, and I know it's contentious, no, no question about it. I know it's contentious. And if we have a chance and people have questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. But what I think a lot of people don't know is that reparations for slavery have actually been tried in this country before, almost succeeded, and then the country back, backed away from it. So let, just let me give you that story. And that'll be what we conclude with before we open up the uh, floor for any questions, if there are, right after the Civil War. And this, again, I just found fascinating fact. Lincoln, first of all, Lincoln didn't free one slave um, that he had any control over. 
The Emancipation Proclamation, if you read it closely, most people never have and just don't. They just assume they know. We were told in school that Lincoln freed the slaves. It's a lot of BS. He did not. Lincoln freed the slaves in the Confederacy. But the Confederacy never recognized Lincoln's authority anyway. So if you read the Emancipation line by line, you will see that Lincoln freed the slaves in Mississippi, but you could still have an enslaved person in Delaware or Massachusetts, which in fact they did. So that I thought was just really kind of strange and also a reason why people like Frederick Douglass, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, thought, yeah, it's a nice gesture, but it doesn't even go near far enough. Not only did Lincoln not free the slaves, Lincoln didn't have a plan for those individuals he did free. Eventually a plan was developed. I talked about how that came about that plan. Some people know as 40 acres and a mule, it came from General William T. Sherman. It was called Special Field Orders 15. It designated first 400,000 acres, then 500,000 additional more acres, almost a million acres of land that would be redistributed, taken from white slave owners and redistributed to the formerly enslaved that would allow them to be really recognize and act as reparations for the years they spent, they spent um, in, enslaved. Wow, it was a serious plan. It was discussed as reparations and it started. It really be, was implemented. There was a bureau called the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, General um, Oliver Otis Howard, who Howard University is named after, started the process of giving out tracts of land. Some 40,000 African-American families were given that land, and then Lincoln was shot. And his successor, Andrew Johnson, stepped in. And then one of the first acts he did was to cancel Special Field Orders 15, give all of that land, well, first of all, take away the land that had already been distributed to those 40,000 families and give it back to the original white slave owners. So that's why I say this country has actually taken steps in the past towards reparation and then back the ray. And a lot of people will ask me, and uh, I wrote a recent um, opinion piece for uh, Seattle Times, well, where do you even start considering reparations? How do you even come up with a figure? Even if I was for it, how would we even go about doing that? And I think it's actually very, very simple. Look, there's a map and I have the map on the book's website of where that land was from Northern Florida to uh, kind of like the middle of, uh, of uh, South Carolina, the coastal property, very rich farmlands. And so I would say simply a great place to start if you're looking at the figures for reparation is determine what the value of that land is right now. That's fairly easy to do. And that's the dollar figure that we need to start talking about in terms of reparations because the country made a commitment to African-Americans that they reneged on and that commitment should be followed through with. So. You know, it's just one of the things that in my work in the book I came upon that helped me better focus on some of these issues which are so front and center in the public discourse today. Now, I certainly could go on talking, but if there are any questions, uh, Sasanya, if we've got any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to consider are trying to answer them at this point. So let me just ask then how we're doing with any questions. And since there are none yet, then let me just talk a little bit further. I mean, I talked about the beginning of the book, talked about the end of the book because the book really ends right after the Civil War and the discussion of reparation. So let me just talk about some moments in between. We had kind of left with that story of how we as a country proceeded from a system in which we didn't have a clear articulated vision of chattel slavery, although that came, and it probably came in the middle to late 1600s. 
So the next epic we really get into is, you know, late 1600s, early 1700s. And one of the things that was so amazing to me in doing the work for this book was to understand that the founding fathers were actually also founding debtors. And there's two things that are really important in this. The late Edmund S. Morgan, a professor at Yale University, had a theory, and it is a theory. Remember, theory is a way you look at historical facts. Morgan's theory was that freedom in America is only possible because of bondage in America. Wow, freedom is possible because of bondage, or bondage makes freedom possible. Now that's a pretty wild, it's a, sim a very simple theory to articulate, but proving it, how could Edmund come up with an idea like that? And here was what Edmund was thinking, and it leads directly into these ideas about the founders as debtors and what was going on in this period after the end of the 1600s. In Virginia, particularly, um, there was the development of agriculture and the first ever cash crop. Now, that first ever cash crop in Virginia and throughout the colonies was tobacco. And in the book, I talk about the life cycle of tobacco uh, and how demanding a mistress it was. I mean, you had to plant and then pull up the plants and replant them and wait until they got a certain height and then cut off the flowers so they didn't flower. And then you had to debug them, literally plunk off bugs and squash them. And there were different bugs based on the time of the year. And once the leaves got a certain uh, width and length, you had to pull them off and let them dry in the sun, but not get too dry. And then maybe dry in a, in a, in a, a, a barn, but you didn't want them to mold. I mean, this was a lot of work. And Edmund was to say, and the evidence certainly is there, that had the founders like Jefferson and Madison and Washington, all of whom were tobacco farmers, had they had to actually farm the tobacco themselves, if they had to be out in the fields and if they had to pull the plants and replant them and cut the flowers off the top and pull the leaves and dry them, they would have been so tied into their tobacco farming they would have never had the time to pontificate on the lofty ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity that we find in the founding documents. Now, that's what Edmund Morgan was talking about, that because people of African descent, Native Americans early on too, were held enslaved, the founding fathers then had the time to pontificate on these great ideals of America that we hold so dear. Without bondage, we would not have these ideas about freedom. Now, I, I am for a moment just gonna switch over to some questions and I see that uh, I've got, there's one question on this screen in which uh, Teresa says, when I think of reparations, I think of indigenous people as well. And you're absolutely true. There's no question about it. I mean, when we're talking about uh, the kinds of reparations that I think should happen in this country, I think it should be across the board. Look, we did that with the Japanese who were interred during World War II. Um, there was horrible, horrible, horrible uh, treatment of Native Americans right from the beginning of this country and stealing land and killing Native Americans almost as sport. And so, yes, I certainly agree. And I also know that um, just as with various aspects of uh, the freedom struggle and civil rights, um, sometimes it's important to acquire those rights in a segment that, in a way that seems uh, reasonable for maybe one group of people to be the tip of the spear that allows that process to go forward so that other groups of people can follow. You saw that during the civil rights movement. 
when because of what people like Thurgood Marshall and Martin King did, it made space for what people like, oh, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and others, both in the women's movement, Native American movement, and also in the LGBTQ movement could do as well too. So I'm a big believer that, you know, we, everyone should be out there advocating for uh, the justice and rights that they deserve. Okay, new questions coming on screen now. Thank you. So let me just read this one. A banker asked why the black press is important to financial institutions' efforts to address the gap in black home ownership. Uh, what would be your answer? So my answer to this might seem a little strange, but I think that the black press is important to addressing the gap in black home ownership because the black press needs to tell the truth about the history of financial institutions in this country and how that history has been tainted and skewed against people of African descent and therefore how they have been not allowed and in some instances railroaded away from the kind of home ownership which would generate the wealth that they could pass on to their families. The practice of redlining, for example, uh, is deep and long in the history of banking institutions, but I think it even goes beyond that. Uh, almost all of the banking institutions whose names we know today, Chase, Wells Fargo, um, uh, Citibank, trace their lineage back to the use of enslaved men and women to back mortgages and other forms of debt. I talk about this in the book uh, as well, where we can see, and I actually you know, report, give um, uh, examples from the books of banks in the 17 and 1800s who owned enslaved men and women because white planters defaulted on their loans. So I think that that then provides a basis to go back and say, look, you as a financial institution were built literally on the bodies of black men and women. And there is an obligation then to make sure that that does not happen again. And unfortunately it is still happening. Redlining is still happening, but I think there's a basis. And I think the black press, uh, and they have in many instances done a good job with that, uh, but the black press needs to be out in front of getting that word out that the history of the financial institutions in this country, look, insurance as well too. You can't get a home, you can't buy a car without insurance. Every major insurance company was built on, on insuring the enslaved. And so right there too, the financial institutions that we use today are institutions created often on the backs and bodies of uh, enslaved men and women. And that's really, the, that's why the book is entitled what it's entitled, Black Lives and the Making of White Power and Wealth. The power and wealth in this country were built on the lives and sometimes the bodies of um, enslaved men and women. And we owe it to their legacy. One, to make sure it never happens again. And two, I think, to um, ensure that reparations do happen uh, for those who uh, were not afforded the opportunity to develop intergenerational wealth, to pass it on from family to family, who had reparations taken away from them. I think the Black press can do a great service in terms of reporting on those facts, documenting those facts, and presenting them in a way um, that is unmistakable in terms of the historical truths that underpin them. Thanks for that question. Let's see. Uh, are there any more? Okay. So the question is, could I say something of the, about the banning of this type of information in schools? And let me say this. So uh, I think it was two, no, a week ago, uh, LA Times came out with an op-ed that I'd written. They were very kind to publish it called Writing While Black. 
And I know you've all, you know, you've probably heard driving while black, that can be a, a hazard, not only hazard, it can be life-threatening. I cite other instances, birding while black can be a, a hazard, uh, shopping while black can be a hazard. Writing while black is now a hazard as well too. I never thought that being a black author would put me in harm's way, but it has. And it's the funny thing is, I, I say funny, it's not really that funny. After the op-ed came out, within an hour, my uh, Twitter account and uh, Facebook and email uh, started to fill up with um, hate-filled and racist messages, almost as a proof in point. So books are being banned, particularly books by uh, African-American authors or books that talk about the history of race and racism in this country. It is, I think, almost criminal that in 2022, we should be talking about banning books because as Governor DeSantis in Florida says, it makes somebody feel guilty. You can't legislate how people feel, number one. And number two, this whole talk of banning books is based on this faulty idea that somehow when you talk about the history of racism in this country, you're talking about critical race theory. I said it earlier and I'll say it again. A theory is a way you look at historical truths and facts, but a theory is not historical truths and facts. Hopefully, some of us learned that in 10th grade when we had to do geometry, because that's all about theories and facts and how you prove things. But I think it speaks to the fact that many of those who would ban this type of information in schools probably didn't to do too well in schools themselves, or at least didn't remember uh, some of what they ought to have learned. Books have been banned. Hey, just take an author like um, um, the woman who wrote uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and she was sent the severed ear of a slave as an indication or an incentive for her not to be in support of the anti-slavery movement. Take someone uh, like Ida B. Wells, who just had just, you know, again, about two weeks ago, President Biden signed the Ida B. Wells anti-lynching law because she was part of the black press that told the truth about the lynchings of black men and women. And she was run out of Tennessee for telling the truth for sharing that information. So there's a history of that. Hitler's Germany banned books they didn't like. Um, Mao Zedong's China banned books and burned books that they didn't like. Al-Qaeda, ISIS banned, uh, you know, burned books, banned books in the Middle East. And then on March 12th, March 12th of this year, just a little while ago, Former President Trump, speaking in South Carolina, tells his followers, lay down your very lives so that critical race theory is not taught in school. That's a call to arms. That's a call to violence against the truth. And it's sad that in 2022, we should be fighting against something like this in this country, but we are, and it's amazing that those of us who are authors, African-American and others writing about the truth of this country would be on the front lines where now our you know, lives are in jeopardy because we're simply trying to tell the truth. Thank you for that question. Uh, please, I, may, I think I've got time for one more question and I'm fine to do that. And this is just, a, oh, this is from a friend, uh, Tilly. Thank you so much for being here and for your comment. Thank, uh, she, and she just says, Clyde, thank you for continuing your quest to share critical information through your research and writing. Uh, I haven't seen Tilly for quite a while. Thank you very much again. Um, you know, this is something which is a passion for me, and that is I, I love history. I think that history tells us something about where we're headed, not just about something that happened. And I really believe that we are smarter people when we understand the past, not as a predictor of the future, but as a prelude to what we choose and want to avoid 
as well as what we choose and want to embrace. There were moments in the book in which I said, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. Let me give you a good example and a positive example of this. Right after the Civil War in a period of this country known as Reconstruction, there were a number of uh, areas in the country, particularly in the South, where the formerly enslaved were in political control. They weren't in economic control, and that was one of the big problems, but they were in political control. They were the majority in the state houses. They actually held some governorships. And in South Carolina, South Carolina, where Trump was on March 12th, telling people to lay down their lives, the South Carolina Senate in 1868 passed laws in which they said women need to have the right to vote. Taxes on the poor need to be lowered. We need to have free public education for all people. We need to have better social safety nets so that when individuals uh, get older, they are protected. The list went on and on and on. And I read that and I even say in the book, it really sounds like something the squad came up with in 2022 or 2021 and not something that a group of formerly enslaved men came up with in 1868. You know, there's a beautiful example of how let's embrace history for what we can learn and see how what we're doing today in the name of progressive social movements, for example, builds on the history of those who have gone before us. So I'm sorry I don't have time for more questions. I wish I did. I look forward to the next opportunity that I have to come back to Busboys and Poets to talk about this book and to talk about the important elements of the history of this country, which I think we forget only at our own great doom. And I want to thank you again for participating in this evening's presentation and discussion. And I also really want to say thank you very much to Busboys and Poets for inviting me here to talk about of blood and sweat, black lives and the making of white power and wealth. Thank you. I was muted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Clyde. That was incredibly, incredibly informative and very, very interesting. Um, as someone who didn't go to high school here and didn't know, you know a lot of the history that I learned today, I'm very grateful for this. Um, and it was such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Susanya. All right, you have a good evening and hopefully we'll get to see you in person sometime soon. Oh, I would really, really look forward to that. Bye now. <laughs> bye bye. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Please stay safe and enjoy the rest of your night and check back in with us on Eventbrite and on our event page to see what we'll have coming up soon. Bye. <laughs>